Okay, everyone, I think time is up. Um, and uh, what we're going to ask for now uh, <laughs> is whether there is a brave soul or two who would be willing to come up and share his or her elevator speech. Come on, this is fun. No, it's not. It's terrifying. It's totally fun. Oh, Yay. Yeah, no. Two volunteers. Perfect. So two volunteers. Yeah, two, oh. two is great. We're actually hoping for two. Yeah. So you can come up here. There's a the microphone. microphone. I want to cause feedback. Hey. hey. So you have to face them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay, so um, you guys are, I guess, the media. Uh, since I'm from Hawaii, I'll say you're the Hawaiian media. And I will try to stay away from words that are specific to Hawaii, um, although they would kind of know that verbiage. But uh, aloha mai kako. My name is Kiana Frank. I'm at the University of Hawaii. And I'm really interested in understanding how microbes interact with their environment. Now, we don't really see microbes because they're so tiny, but they have such a big influence on our planet. They influence. Uh, atmospheric compositions, what we can breathe. They influence the cycling of nutrients that are important for our agricultural and aquacultural resources. And sometimes they can be potentially bad. And the thing about microbes, because they're so small, is we don't really understand a lot about them. So I'm really trying to get into our lands and our watersheds and ask some very basic questions. Who's there? What they're doing? and how fast they're doing this. And this is really important for our land managers and our stakeholders in trying to better understand how we can move towards the sustainability and, and resilience of our natural resources. And so I currently work in a native Hawaiian fish pond in a coastal region, and I'm trying to help them answer these questions. Uh, with respect to climate change and these impending storm, episodic storm events and trying to help the stakeholders and managers create better management strategies, uh, create mitigation efforts during big storms, and just for them to better understand how this, these, these microbes who are at the base of the ecosystem affect the fish that they produce, the quality and the quantity. And so my research really helps uh, understanding our environments and and the products we can produce. That was that was excellent. One thing I love about listening to elevator speeches is how much I learn. Yeah. And um, we've got scientists uh, at NCAR who do work in similar areas, and I still feel like wow, there's that was a, a really good explanation. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, so this is aimed at you. You're all scientists that are doing similar things and trying to uh, interest you in the particular science I'm doing. So um, I'm Christopher Klein, a postdoc currently at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm trying to understand exactly the, f the, the flow of energy in a system that, that I think we're all interested in. That is the heliosphere. It's, it's a word that we're using to describe uh, not necessarily the Earth, and not necessarily as astronomical objects, but things we can send a probe to and actually measure in situ. Uh, so uh, the sun is very hot. It's a plasma. Plasmas are interesting uh, in and of themselves because they, they have uh, not only uh, are susceptible to magnetic and electric fields, but self-consistently generate them. They're very uh, rare on Earth, but they're very common in the visible universe. And so it's important to understand fundamental processes in them. That the fundamental process that I'm trying to understand is exactly how uh, the solar wind, which is a diffuse plasma, is accelerated from the sun's surface and leads to the creation of space weather. So uh, space weather is, is just like weather on Earth, except it's weather that occurs within our, our heliosphere. And so NASA, in 2018, is going to be sending Solar Probe Plus, a mission to within about 4 million miles of the sun's surface, to measure this novel plasma environment. And we have 
decades of theories preparing for, uh, you know, making predictions for exactly how the, the, the solar wind is accelerated off the sun's surface, but we, they're conflicting. They're, they're, they, they make different predictions. And so I'm working on taking those theories and saying, if theory A is correct, if this type of wave particle interaction is indeed leading to the energization of the solar wind, this is, uh, this is what probe should see. But if it's instead reconnection or another process, this is indeed uh, instead what probe should see. So we're preparing for that launch, we're making predictions now, and we're hoping that uh, once probe is up there, we're going to be able to differentiate between these different processes and improve our ability to understand the system in which the Earth is embedded and um, improve our forecasts for uh, this environment that we all live in. That was excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to let you guys keep this because um, you know what I'd like to do is okay. actually have these guys talk about what okay. what you thought was tricky about this. I thought you both of you did a great job of making it societally relevant. I mean, and David's right. I mean, it was just it was really fascinating, especially the astrophysics. I'm always amazed at when an astrophysicist can explain in a comprehensible way <laughs> what he or she is doing. But so, and I don't know if you want to start off, but how did you tell me about the challenges that you guys that you found as you were as you were coming up with your elevator speech? Um, so one of the challenges I always find is, is I kind of bridge two worlds. I bridge this very cultural Hawaiian world and the scientific world, and the language we use is not similar at all. It, it, it's kind of even one step further than the, the lay world. And so one of the challenges I faced, even speaking to you guys, is I know how to speak to my community, but it wouldn't have been accessible to all of you. And so I was trying to create a speech that was, didn't use the Hawaiian words and jargon so that you could understand. So I think the language for me is always the most challenging in um, figuring out what, how it's accessible to somebody else. You did a good job of it. It was really comprehensive and comprehensible. Uh, I, and I definitely second that. It's, it's uh, the, the language issue is a difficult one, right? If, if I come up to a person and say plasma, do, do, do they understand exactly what I'm saying there? And if, if they do, I don't need to take 15 seconds to say this is an ionized gas. If they don't, then it's, I need to take a step back and, 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 and do that. Uh, the, the other thing that was more difficult for me is I, I do focus on fundamental processes rather than just the actual societal impact. But people here don't care that I can do a contour integral and go through 15 pages of math. They care about how will that be plugged into a model eventually. And so taking a step back from you know doing the, the really nasty math and, and saying why is this important I think is useful because it's also important for grant writing and, and paper writing and everything else that we do in the communication. So. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're we've got like another minute or two, um, if that's okay. Any maybe one or two questions, and then Rachel and I will also be around during lunch if other yeah, people have questions. Yeah, if you want to questions. share challenges, I mean, I, I think that's the most interesting thing, just to see really where people had um, experienced difficulties or not. Or yeah, go ahead. Thanks to both of you. That was very yeah, brave. Thank you. Is, it, is it okay <laughs> if it's not a question about elevator speeches? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Which were great. Um, uh, I'm interested in knowing how you can make sure that the message that you send out in an interview, which is not necessarily something you can prepare completely ahead of, ha ahead of time, is really in line with the message that your institution wants to get out. Okay, that's a, a great question. Um, I, I think the easiest the simplest answer I can give you is to talk with your communications office at your institution and, and share that concern with them. I, I mean, in general, scientific institutions are going to be supportive of, you know, kind of free and open discussion of the science. Some of them are going to be, you know, have some constraints around, say, political statements or that kind of thing. But I think as long as you stick to your research, that, that should be fine. But again, I think talking with your media shop would be, would be the best idea. Um, one, one general thing I'll add to that is uh, you will be asked in the course of an interview something that you may not have expertise in. And it's fine to say, I, I don't have expert. I can't talk about that. I'm not an expert in that. That's totally fine to say that you don't know something. Any final question before we break for lunch? I feel like I'm between people and food. OK. Uh, so I have a question about uh, your previous topic, about talking to program officers.
officers, and you gave a suggestion to keep them updated. And, uh, and this is a great suggestion. I mean, I mean, just thinking about it, I want to do it. But uh, let's say that, I mean, uh, let's say that you're a program officer and you have uh, lots and lots and lots of scientists to manage. And let's say that, I mean, I have intermediate results. I don't have the end results that you can, you know, give to the media. I mean, uh, how does it work? Do I just come to you and say, hey, I would like to talk to you about science, or hey, I would like to keep you updated, or I mean, and, and I just give out my intermediate results, or? Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a judgment call. It's a little bit of a balance. On the one hand, program officers do want to hear from you. On the other hand, they are busy, and they want to hear from you, but they don't want to hear too much from you. So I would, I would kind of calibrate it. I think ideally sort of checking in with them at the onset, either if you're in Washington or in person, or maybe just setting up a brief call with them and, and give them a sense of, the, of what you're working on, and then maybe waiting until your results are final. Obviously, if the program officer is saying to you, that's fascinating, keep me posted, even when you have intermediate results, I'd, I'd like to know about it, that's a different thing. But in general, in that situation, I would probably, you know, wait till you've got some results. Does that, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, please. I'm not, this is a little outside my expertise. Yeah, so I would say any time that you, there's some sort of publication, or if, there's some sort of something in the news media, send us that. If it's intermediate, sometimes a good thing to do is before AGU or other professional conferences, email your program officer and just ask them if they're going to be at the meeting and tell them the time, the room of either your poster or your talk so that they kind of know that. And then, because there's a lot of intermediate results that get presented there, and it gives them an opportunity to come and talk to you then and see what you're presenting and and believe me I know from an AGU trying to myself find where all of my PIs are presenting or because I do research experiences for undergrads trying to find all the REUs students that went through is really hard but when the PIs email me and they're like oh here's all of my list of all my REU students that are presenting then I just put it in my calendar and I can I can find them. So I think that's the best thing for intermediate if you're going to a conference is a good time to see if your program officer is going to be there and just tell them when your poster or your talk is. Thank you. So we are now out of time um, and I think we'll be breaking for lunch but we'll be around during lunch if you have questions and our email addresses are there. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and David. I thought it was great. Thank you very much. You. And so, yes, we're breaking for lunch. We have an hour. And um, we'll, <laughs> just an hour. But we'll meet back in here for a great presentation around the art of teaching. But yeah, take a break.